think we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody here today for the fourth annual Herbert L. Bernstein Memorial Lecture. This is a bittersweet day in the life of Duke Law School. We come together to celebrate the life of a professor who enriched this school for 17 years while our hearts are still heavy with a fresh loss of another beloved professor, Melvin Shim, who was, a, who was part of this community for over five decades. Mel and Herbert were great friends to each other, and many of us were among the lucky who were friends and colleagues of both. Today it is a special pleasure, pleasure to be unveiling the portrait of Professor Bernstein. This portrait will hang in the halls with those of other faculty who have been part of the legacy of Duke Law School. Because Professor Bernstein died so suddenly and had no announced intention to stop teaching, he had not sat for a formal photographic or painted portrait. Instead, with a bit of technical innovation, we were able to enlarge a favorite photo of him and have it colorized by an artist under the guidance of his beloved widow, Waltred, whom I'm pleased is here with us today. Herbert was a fantastic teacher and scholar in the areas of contract law, comparative, and private international law. Born in Hamburg, Germany, Herbert survived the terrors of World War II as a boy, was educated at the University of Hamburg, and later joined the prestigious Max Planck Institute for Foreign and Private International Law. He came to the U.S. in 1962 to study at the University of Michigan, and before coming to Duke, taught at the University of Hamburg, Berkeley, and the University of Southampton. It is not an overstatement to say that everybody, everybody loved Herbert. His students loved him for the quality of his teaching and for the respect and warmth he showed them. Likewise, the faculty and staff at this school loved him for his kindness and support, his passion for history and law, his commitment to tolerance and justice, and his humor. We grieved at his sudden death, but now we can celebrate the image of his smile and warmth shining down on us from this lovely portrait. Before our lecture, I want to ask just two of our colleagues to um, say a word uh, about one of their favorite colleagues, and then we'll introduce today's speaker. First, Neil Vidmar, and then Paul Hagen. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. That. Uh, twinkle in his eyes shows up and uh, I actually think that after all this time it's a pretty emotional experience for me. As, as the Dean mentioned, uh, Herbert uh, Bernstein had law degrees and law experience in both uh, Germany and the United States but his perspective was actually very very broad. Uh, he was a true scholar in the classical sense he uh, had deep knowledge, and often when I would have conversations with him, we would flit from history uh, of Rome, the history of Greece, France, and so forth. And uh, even on technical points, he was able to put law into the perspective of the historical and the social context. I was very fortunate to be near him, uh, just a couple of offices away, and two, maybe three times per week, we'd have these wide-ranging conversations about law, about history, about literature, about uh, contemporary events, and that to me is a mark of the kind of perspective that he had on life, and I know that others of my colleagues had similar experiences. Now, I never had the opportunity to observe Herbert teaching in the classroom, but I having an office near him was very uh, often seeing him and, and what I think this is the point that I'd like to make about him as a professor. Uh, he was a true mentor to students. His door was always open and he spent many, many hours uh, every week with students in a way, in fact, I think many more hours than most of us do, talking, uh, mentoring, sometimes helping with personal problems, 
uh, and I was able to observe this, and this is the kind of, of, of uh, image I have of the man. Uh, this portrait reminds me that he was a man of deep learning, of humor and compassion, as the dean said, and a teacher at all times. And I think this portrait will remind those of us who knew him uh, what we miss. Uh, the dean instructed me in no uncertain terms to be short, and as you can see, I have complied. <laughs> so, uh, Suetonius, the Roman historian, records that an anguished Caesar Augustus exclaimed upon learning of the destruction of his army at the hands of Hermann der Herushka, Quintili Vare Legionis Reddit. Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions. I do not know how many of my colleagues know that passage. I'm quite certain that none have ever found occasion to introduce it into our conversations. None, that is, except Herbert Bernstein. He introduced it seamlessly into one of our discussions and to good effect. It was one of those discussions that was unusual in the sense that you never had such a discussion with anyone else. It was not unusual to have such discussions with Herbert. Herbert was an uncommonly erudite man. His knowledge and interest extended to an astounding range of subjects. That a German scholar would be erudite is perhaps not surprising. Those with the Zitzfleisch to make it through that system are often erudite. That such a scholar would wear that mantle of erudition with the lightness and playfulness that Herbert did is much more remarkable. And he made this, and I suspect every other place that he was, a happier and richer one for it. Herbert was an uncommonly graceful man. He was extremely funny, and his wit could be quite biting. The bite, however, never, in my experience, demeaned. Rather, by puncturing pretense, it restored matters to a human scale that permitted all, both the butt of the joke and the delighted listeners, to return to their work refreshed. Since Herbert's death on April 20, 2001, this country has been battered in New York by a terrorist attack from the skies and along the Gulf by the awesome force of nature's winds. Exactly 62 years and two months ago, Herbert Bernstein was subjected to an event that combined the two, the firebombing of Hamburg. This attack from the skies produced a firestorm that created hurricane force winds, devastated much of Herbert's native city, killed tens of thousands of people, and left Herbert homeless. How this republic will come out of its latest trials remains uncertain. Herbert emerged from his, neither embittered nor cynical, but with a deep humanity and tolerance. We can only hope that we do so well. I miss Herbert. I miss the opportunity to seek his counsel. I am pleased that his picture, even if it is, as Valtraud noted last night, for Schoenert, uh, will be here to remind me of him and his contributions to the life of this place. Like Augustus, and I recognize this is likely to be the first and last time I will ever be compared to the emperor, uh, I mourn the loss of this legion of a man. But I today feel only honored that I had the chance, if only too briefly, to take the field with him. Thank you, Paul and Neil, for those remarks. I next want to introduce our speaker, um, Richard Buxbaum from Bolt Hall, as the, as the fourth annual Bernstein Lecturer. Professor Buxbaum is the Jackson H. Ralston Professor of International Law at the University of California, Berkeley, where he has been on the faculty since 1961, including the time I myself was a student at Bolt Hall. 
It is an added pleasure to welcome Professor Buxbaum as a former colleague of our late friend and colleague, Herbert Bernstein, in whose honor this lecture is held each year. Professor Buxbaum is an immensely versatile scholar. In addition to his prominence in the comparative law field, a, a field he shared with, with Professor Bernstein, uh, Professor Buxbaum is well known for his scholarship in corporate law. His work on preferred stock is the leading work on the subject. He has served on various state and national committees engaged in drafting of corporate and securities legislation, and he was an advisor on the American Law Institute's Corporate Governance Project from 1986 to 1994. In comparative law, but Professor Buxbaum founded and was the first chair of its Center for German and European Studies at, at UC Berkeley and the Center for Western European Studies, and he was Dean of International and Area Studies from 1993 to 1999. He also served as the first director of the Earl Warren Legal Institute, Institute at Berkeley. He was editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Comparative Law from 1987 until 2003, and I'm told by members of our faculty that, that it was his leadership that made that journal into the prominent uh, scholarly journal that it is. Professor, Professor Buxbaum also has a long and fascinating record of engagement in issues of great public significance. He was one of the five defense counsel in the criminal proceedings against the 773 members of the free speech movement from 1964 to 1967 represented various campus organizations and individuals in cases arising out of the Vietnam War protests, and was defense counsel in a large number of criminal proceedings that accompanied the Third World Strike of 1969-70, which was a factor in the development of affirmative action programs on the, on the Berkeley campus. In 2001, almost 50 years after he had, after he had served in the U.S. Army occupying post-war Germany, Professor Buxbaum was appointed by the State Department as representative to the three-person Forced Labor Property Claims Commission. This commission was established under an agreement between the U.S. and Germany to rule on claims for compensation for loss of property filed by victims of the Nazi regime. That, that commission has just wrapped up its work after ruling on well over 30,000 claims. Professor Buxbaum received his undergraduate and law degrees from Cornell and his LLM from Bolt Hall in 1953. He is the recipient of a number of honorary degrees and prestigious honors, among them the Humboldt Prize for Humanities and Social Sciences, the Arthur Burkhart Prize in 2000, and election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2001. <laughs> Professor Buxbaum has published widely in the areas of comparative and international corporate and economic law. His topic today for the fourth annual Bernstein Lecture in international and comparative law is comparative law as a bridge between the nation state and the global economy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Buxbaum. <laughs> Dear Waltraud and Dean Bartlett, colleagues, friends, it's, uh, uh, it's rather personal for me, too. So I can't help but spend a couple of minutes on this uh, wonderful person and his background. We were born uh, three months and 300 kilometers apart. So that's a beginning in terms of our common track. We have uh, somewhat similar backgrounds in terms of the uh, relationship to the regimes of that period. Uh, I did come out before the war. Uh, Herbert is one of that generation, that second generation who uh, went through those tragedies and uh, violence during the war. Uh, we have uh, an interesting reflection, and we often had that in person since we knew each other well, on not so much that past, but what it signified for the way we saw the world at present. I want to begin, first of all, by saying I'm proud and, and particularly pleased to be now in the company of your first three speakers. I have close connection with all of them. Shibli Malad was at Berkeley for some considerable time before he left for SOAS in London. We were good friends there. And I've been for over 30 years, in fact, in one case, over 40 years, close friends of Hein Kurtz and of Christian Jurgis. So um, 
it's it's a kind of a pleasant feeling to have, to be in that in that setting, and I don't mind indulging for a moment in that uh, uh, reflected warmth. I also appreciate very much uh, a kind of uh, value and style that I find here at Duke in this legacy. Not only that you would have uh, this kind of value that brings portraits of your uh, former colleagues to life for a generation that did not know them. Uh, it also uh, reminds me, in a way, of a fairly long uh, legacy of emigre scholars who have, I don't want to say always enriched, but certainly uh, varied the life of the rather parochial American legal education. When I went to uh, law school, it was the period when the first generation of emigre scholars had made their mark on uh, the academy. Rudolf Schlesinger was a teacher of mine. Stefan Riesenfeld and Albert Ehrenzweig in Berkeley were teachers. Many of you here of the older generation of colleagues knew them. Uh, Fritz Kessler, David Daube, no point going on to all the numbers. Then came that first post-war generation. Some of them emigres like myself, who uh, did all their education pretty much here. Others like Herbert, like his equally uh, 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 wonderful, uh, also acerbic colleague Fritz Jünger, who died the same year and suddenly, uh, a, a group that is still with us, uh, Peter Hay, for example. And then, of course, the next generation. Uh, I'm, I'm staying for a moment mostly with the German-speaking groups, although it is larger than that, of course. Matthias Reimann at Michigan, Joachim Zeckel, and now you have your own colleagues here, uh, the newest generation. So there is quite a thread, and it extends beyond uh, Germany, believe me. Uh, we have uh, the same, it extends now beyond Europe, I'm pleased to say. Uh, and it has done a lot, I think, to help create the bridges to the world that the United uh, States, in its wide borders and equally wide parochialism, still needs. Uh, and that's, of course, in a sense, the subject that I'm talking about today. Comparative law as a bridge between the nation state and the global economy. I'd like to experiment, and I know that I'm going to have to do it in less than 30 minutes. Um, I started with far too little material, and then in the usual surge of desperate energy, I end up with far too much. You know, so. Uh, We'll see how it goes. Uh, what I want to do is uh, suggest and weave together three strands of a topic suggested by this title, uh, the bridge between the nation state and the global economy. The first has to do with the fact that while organized economic life is increasingly transnational, much law bearing on that economy still is national law. Now, the second strand reverses that, that is to say, uh, it has to do with the recognition that much national law has begun to move one step up the ladder, namely to the increasing federalization or regionalization of law that was previously national. But also, we recognize there the inevitable and I think politically necessary lag between the uh, regionalization of organized economic life and that of organized legal uh, life. Uh, we can't have democratic uh, advancement uh, into that level uh, as readily as one can inside a country. The third strand, however, is specific to my interests and to this topic, and that is that the characterization of that part of the law that bears on the economy, and that's, after all, what this is about, uh, that bears, whether it's national, regional, or even global, that bears on the slippery notion of economic law an ill-defined concept that straddles private law and public law. Uh, I'm going to try to suggest a mission for comparative law, I call it the coordination mission, that might promise a somewhat more fruitful role for comparative law in this contemporaneous context that I've just briefly described, than do earlier missions. Now, given both Herbert Bernstein's and my uh, backgrounds, it's not surprising that the comparison is going to be mostly between the US, United States, and the European uh, Union regimes. That comparison with the US, however, is really only relevant when we look at the second of these three strands, namely the increasing regionalization, or in our case, federalization, of prior uh, <laughs> lower level law, 
because that's where the difference is between the two hierarchies, the more tightly federal hierarchy in the United States and the more loosely one in Europe become relevant. So that's really the only place where I can do anything worthwhile in comparing U.S. and European regimes. Uh, what, what is uh, obvious from that, and I'll say it right at the outset, is that uh, national law within the U uh, European Union, and therefore its coordination uh, within that region of member states, is more important that as a mission, then is the shrinking remnant of interstate co uh, coordination in the United States. In fact, some of you would be surprised to think there's, any, there's anything left you know, to, uh, to think about in that regard. Although I would say that the differences in capital punishment uh, in uh, regimes of state law do suggest that we have some surprisingly large areas where we allow a kind of variation that to the outside observer is simply uh, startling, uh, if not for other reasons shocking. So what this suggests is I'm going to talk more about the European than about the American scene. Uh, one point has to do with uh, a problem in the European community that arises from legal doctrine. It's the third strand, namely the struggle over the definition of economic law. Right? Why does it matter uh, there uh, more than it does here? Certainly the relatively recent European focus on private law harmonization in Europe as distinguished from the original public law harmonization, uh, is understandable. The heavily top-down harmonization of laws was considered essential to the establishment of a genuine internal common market, and slowly it has had to move into other spheres than the original sphere of government regulation and deregulation of economic life, and that problematizes the distinction between private and public law in Europe, the economic law straddling between them. Well, whatever the origins and motivations of the current focus uh, in uh, uh, Europe on private law harmonization, the result is clear. The decades-long monopoly of public law scholarship about the European community is over and has been over for some time. European private law has been on the agenda for over a decade and has developed a dynamic of its own that even transcends the reasons for its original appearance and maybe even scares some of the very proponents uh, of harmonization in that subject. For some time in the 1990s, there was an effort to position this harmonization or even unification effort of private law in Europe as a contemporary version of the law of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the usus modernus pandectaum, uh, and it claimed much attention. There's a certain school of thought uh, uh, associated with that. Uh, it hasn't, in my view, uh, received much uh, purchase, uh, in part because of its uh, perhaps inherently somewhat conservative uh, uh, substance, although that's a debatable point, but more in part, I think, because it is challenged by an older movement that insists on the centrality of economic law as the legitimating basis and also the limiting basis for any unification of private law that the European Union should strive for. After all, that hues more closely to the still largely economic function and missions of the EU, even in this day of new pillars, defense, security, environment, justice, and so on. Uh, what economic law is, is in a sense, a challenge to the concept of private law, and I don't think it's a challenge that the modern versions of Roman law can actually really capture in its full private and public mixture. Okay, now, like Herbert Bernstein, this is a European subject. Uh, but it also, like him, I think, actually, illuminates the kind of tension between the uh, resolutely unsystematic Anglo-American conception of law and the apparently resolutely systematic uh, conception of law associated with civilian legal families. I'm going to try to explain that rather abstract concept. But it is a tension apparent in the very label economic law. Whoever in the United States has heard of the, uh, uses the word economic law you know, as, a, as a subject, right? It's unfamiliar to us. The notion that it's a challenge to private law perplexes us. And in part, that's because private law itself, uh, as a concept, private law is not a particularly significant issue uh, in terms of our legal discourse. I'm a teacher of corporation law, and it would never have occurred to me, and certainly not to my colleagues, uh, to worry about whether it was a private law subject uh, and therefore, uh, you can't treat civil litigation under Rule 10b-5 uh, in the course, right? Uh, 
I certainly wouldn't have been concerned about the contours of an amorphous notion like economic law in order to decide where to place its components in our curricular divisions. Uh, that's unknown to us, right? We're, we're not going to worry about system in that sense. If anything, I think we have the opposite problem. We probably, uh, because of the dominance, particularly of the economic analysis of law, we, uh, across the curriculum, that is so advanced that like uh, Voltaire's Monsieur Jordan, we speak economic law without knowing it you know, uh, in this sense. And by the way, when I say without knowing it, that has two meanings. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and, in my, and in my case, both meanings apply. So uh, I don't want to uh, do that to anybody else, but uh, it's pretty clear for us older guys that that's one of the problems. In other words, the notion that economic law is a challenge to private law has a very European or civilian flavor about it. But, and this is my second strand on regionalization or federalization, the notion that economic law is a challenge to traditional understandings about the competencies of the units of a federal system in the division of power sense, that is very much, as much an American notion as it is a European notion. It was just as Felix, well, he was professor then, Felix Frankfurter, who in his North Carolina, I think it was, lectures, not here, unfortunately, but at UNC, uh, uh, in his lectures on the Dormant Commerce Clause back in the 30s, said that so far as the states were concerned, given the Dormant Commerce Clause, the only, in the absence of federal action, their only, the only regulator they were entitled to enact was laissez-faire. It was just a very straight uh, punch. And that brings me a little bit to the one comparative element here, uh, namely a comparative brief look at EC and US on this classic division of powers issue. Okay. Any argument that national law needs to remain relevant at a time when the transnational economy, uh, economy in facilitative terms demands a transnational legal order and in regulatory or redistributive terms should be forced to accept a regional uh, um, a transnational legal order, any comparison has to begin there. And the, the term I've used to highlight that function of the regional level at which uh, a proper confrontation, if we want to call it that, between law and the economy can be posed is that of coordination. For me, it joins and supplements the two traditional functions of comparative law that have been the general academic discourse for over two centuries. The very instrumental notion, you identify other law in order that you can consider whether it's a good idea to apply it here. Uh, that's, that's a very classic uh, notion, and that is, of course, what, particularly the French tradition of the 19th century, was what it was understood at. And then, towards the end of the 19th century, but broken, of course, by World War I, the kind of universal value notion of comparative law. It is the pathbreaker towards universal law and global law, the Wigmore, the Kohler, uh, and so forth. For me, instead, coordination, the newer but still uh, to be placed along with these two missions, coordination implies a horizontal function. So I better start describing it finally. The adaptation of a state's laws to those of another formally equal state, a cooperation of equals within a system that is either somewhat hierarchical, as in the sense of federal state structures, or simply network as a web of formally, formally equal sovereigns without a more or less authoritative center. Now, in comparative terms, of course, the concept is going to be more relevant in the European than in the United States uh, Union. Despite the sputtering states' rights discourse, the legal orders of our states in the, UN, in the US exist at the sufferance of a national legal order as authority, authoritatively interpreted by the constitutional terms of the Supreme Court. Puppy federalism is the wonderful phrase that my uh, former colleague, now unfortunately at Penn, Ed Rubin, uh, used as his term for this arrangement. And it is an apt term, you know, given the powerful preemptive role of the supremacy and the dormant commerce clauses, especially in economic law. What little horizontally developed uniformity our states have seemed to achieve voluntarily, you know, from below, is in the sense, is really only voluntary in the sense that they acceded to the requirements of the market in preference to what otherwise would surely have been imposed as national law. That is, they, they unified in the shadow of, they, they unified bottom up in the shadow of the threat of top-down unification. I mean, I don't think you can see anything from ranging from the, uh, 
Uniform Commercial Code to the Model Act uh, and so forth as anything other than that example. The European Union is not yet at that stage, and its supremacy clause, in quotes, has not yet been lowered to room height. The concept of limited delegated powers granted the Union still is taken, if only for political terms, relatively seriously. And indeed, one of the principal reasons for that constraint bears directly on my vision of a coordination concept as a function of comparative law. And that reason is the so-called democratic deficit, the fact that the one body directly elected by the peoples of the member states, the European Parliament, to this day is not yet a parliament in the classic sense. Despite the increase in its role of co-legislator, the legislative initiative, as, we all, as you know, remains with the Commission and in a different sense with the Council. Organs, especially the Commission, whose members are appointed by the executive branches of the national governments represented in the EU's Council of Ministers. In this framework of very thinned out, very attenuated lines of democratic legitimation uh, via the aggregate of national electorates, in which at least two tiers of government lie between any given national polity and the EU's principal legislative bodies, unification or harmonization of law from the top down suffers two potentially serious negative consequences. And incidentally, I'm very delighted that one of your predecessors in this lecture series was Christian Jurgis, because he, more than anybody else in Europe, has really stressed uh, the critical importance of this issue of democratic legitimation inside the European lawmaking function. So what are these negative consequences in this context of a thin democratic structure and uh, a, a powerful, a much more powerful set of member states than are our states in the Union. Well, the first consequence, it's fact common to both regimes, ours too, uh, concerns the problem of experimentation or the benefits of experimentation and of flexibility, both of which are values that we on both sides value. Uh, and that is a, a difficult situation um, in European harmonization. The, the, we have a lot of consensus, I may be a uh, slight outlier on this, but we have a lot of consensus on the benefits of regulatory competition, or at least on using the states as laboratories, right? And that is applied today to challenge much national or centralized legislation, right? In the U.S., of course, that's more of an academic than a practical argument. I think puppy federalism is still uh, my preferred description for why that's not as real uh, an issue as um, it might be. Now I agree. Uh, no, I'm going to stop. I'm going to hold that agreement off for a minute. In the U.S., it's uh, more of an academic than a practical argument. The essential uniformity of U.S. economic law, based, of course, on the essential unity of the U.S. economy, has narrowed the field of application in which that value of regulatory competition really has much purchase. Uh, and to repeat Frankfurter's axiom, that competition in any event can really only be uh, a kind of race for the bottom. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I just mean in the sense that the competition is for facilitative uh, uh, legislation. It cannot be, by definition, for, regular, for, for more controlling legislation. Very difficult, of course, in the US system. Uh, the European Union situation is rather different. Its member states' laws, and that's simply a reflection of its member states' less complete economic unity to this day, evidence a much higher degree of differentiation. It's not only regulatory competition that is at issue in Europe, it's regulatory variation, which will have more bite uh, there, and given, at least until recently, the less rigorous application of the European Union version of the Dormant Commerce Clause, it may be less controllable. I have to put to one side here whether the jurisprudence that has been developed in corporate law you know, through the right of establishment uh, uh, provision of the union, namely freedom of mobility of corporations, is going to change that scene. But uh, pace that particular question, uh, there is, continues to be more regulatory variation and uh, less rigorous application of a strong uh, dormant commerce clause. Now, in this situation, I, I feel that one gets to a kind of an odd uh, uh, um, uh, state. The attraction of top-down unification, in a way, now is demanded both by the market, uh, if I can use organized economic actors as a quote, a market, but it's also uh, uh, pushed by the more regulatory-oriented member states. That is to say, you have an odd uh, 
set of slightly incompatible pressures evolving towards the lawmaking process of the European Union uh, from the exact opposite sides, if you want to call it that, of economic uh, activity, the actors and the governors. Right? As a result, a somewhat peculiar situation uh, may have arisen. Market pressures push for positive central legislation or jurisprudence uh, for certain facilitative reasons, but that may be a less desirable solution than the one that the classic proponents of regulatory competition have ever, ever envisaged uh, originally. They don't like that approach. And even among those who are less convinced of the benefits of the version of competition, there is a concern with some of the more practical consequences of top-down unification in the European context. The legislative process is clumsier. The formal structure of directives with their need for national adoption and concretization paradoxically leaves room for resistance uh, at the member state level. And the flexibility needed for adaptation to change circumstances is certainly less than optimal uh, in that approach. Uh, I should have recognized long before now, and I will do it now in the midstream of this talk, that I'm doing all of this with a good deal of diffidence and abashment in the case of the presence of two experts on European Union law here. Uh, I kept trying to avoid their glances, but I think by now I might as well recognize that uh, Professor Dollinger and Professor Ahn are here and uh, scare me. You know, but we'll, uh, we'll see how, how this goes afterwards, right? Now let me go, however, because it's, I find it more interesting, the, or more important. The second negative consequence of top-down unification uh, or harmonization, namely, is the already mentioned democratic deficit. Right? And that's unique to the UA, European Union and maybe the more important. The coordination of lawmaking among sovereign states of equal formal status with an identical need to adapt to the realities of an economic system that more and more transcends their particular boundaries. Right? Certainly, uh, the, this coordination effort, I think, offers a better chance of eliminating a politically volatile deficit, democratic deficit, than does the top-down harmonization, quite apart from the technical flexibility, et cetera, problems. And it provides a further benefit, which uh, maybe I'm alone in believing is one, the power inherent in such a coordinated state network to control the race to, facilitative, to the facilitative bottom, I, I hate the word bottom, but to the facilitative nirvana, uh, that states standing in isolated and non-communicative competition with one another always face. That sounds like a cartel of states that I'm uh, uh, claiming here in this coordination function, and it's certainly therefore antithetical to the very notion of regulatory competition. Nevertheless, you know, if it accommodates a decent, meaning something I like, right, a decent uh, level of regulation and perhaps of redistributive policies, I would consider that a virtuous cartel uh, in this, this coordinated network. You could say uh, that isn't something similar happening with the current effort of the political organs of the European Union to achieve a similar goal by combining the papal principle of subsidiarity with the principle of minimum common standards. <laughs> Absent minimum standards, the subsidiarity, the Casi de Dijon principle, mandating essentially full faith and credit to the laws of the home state of a legal person whose behavior is to be controlled, that leads to a market-driven facilitative law that I've mentioned. Right? <laughs> to control that drift, the concept of minimum common standards is superimposed on the subsidiarity concept and we have our own example here, much as the new um, uh, superimposition of certain standards under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act have been superimposed upon state corporation law in a patchwork of certain sensitive fields. But, and I think it's applicable to both Sarbanes-Oxley and to this European scene, while minimal common standards are a coarser mesh than fully centralized lawmaking, by definition they cannot really uh, uh, avoid the ossification, the inflexibility over time. Look at the struggle right now to loosen up some of the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, standards. And of course, they still suffer some of the problems of the described democratic deficit. Now, I have to specify before I can give you in five minutes near the end one little example of how coordination might operate on some real subjects, right? <clears throat> uh, some of the attributes. Uh, and that returns me a little bit to economic law as a definitional issue. I make three assumptions uh, about the addressees of economic law. First, in the present era, post-state -social socialism, 
The transnational economy is built upon privately owned, not state owned, business firms. Firms that are internally, however, hierarchically organized and plan their own activities, even if they exist in an unplanned uh, economy. Second, in the short run, trade and investment are largely, though of course not totally, concentrated only at the next level above the national economy, the regional economy of blocks, rather than already concentrated at the global level, the third level. And my third assumption about attributes or preceding attributes is that legal, regional legal regimes also begin to arise, the EU of course, but they will have widely different levels of vertical division of powers. And while they will increase in scope overall, they will only partially shadow or track the, the degree of integration at the, regional, at the level of regional economic integration. So you have a, a kind of a mismatch, if you want, even at the regional level of law and economy uh, to sort of a, a lesser one, but something to, uh, a, a below the, above the level of the mismatch at the single state level. Okay, now I can say something about what are the elements of the coordination of economic law. Well, first, as I said, and it's paradox, yes, we think of the harmonization today of private law <coughs> pardon me, in the uh, European Union, but the essential core of comparative law as a scholarly discipline is, is going to have to move more and more to its public law if economic law is its core of concern. That's partly due simply to the assumption that economic law is more than private law. It's also due to the fact, however, and this is an important point for me, by now I'm afraid can't, there's no such thing as an important point for you, but uh, we'll, <coughs> we'll have to see. Uh, it's due to the fact that any single state's effort to legislate about cross-border economic matters in which other states also have a legislative interest, right, absolutely needs to consider the legislation's potential prescriptive reach across its borders, and that alone, simply taken as private international law, is no longer private, but uh, a public issue. And the same is true at the regional level. They, too, will have to um, engage in these coordination efforts, and particularly since they have no higher hierarchy to speak of, they are condemned to follow the path, this path, of doing comparative law, namely coordination, if they're going to engage in it at all. And that means that even more than on the purely interstate level, issues of policy analyses and of the appropriate reach of prescriptive jurisdiction will be essential. And that's now my second point about the significance of of how comparative law has to function in the future. That is the significance of the economic, given, but also other social science elements that underlie or that influence lawmaking in any given state. Because that increases as the substantive differences between the different economic or other policy judgments or other states increase. We must deepen and contextualize comparative law practice to what you might call comparative social science practice. I'll give you a different example. The, the Italian uh, comparativist Rodolfo Sacco has very fruitfully in his study of legal formats explored not only the hidden forms, the cryptotypes he calls them, that underlie and support legal doctrine, but also the hidden forms, and this is for me even more interesting, that underlie or support the social science or policy judgments that in turn underlie the legal doctrines. The uncovering of these cryptotypes is inescapably a function, social science function, of comparative law. Its importance, I think, cannot be underestimated. At the domestic level, the very, and let me put it this way, at the domestic level, within one state, right, the various ideological, political, economic conflicts that underlie all lawmaking can let be left more or less unarticulated because they are embedded and understood, in a sense, in the historically contingent path of that polity. But at the interstate level, these differences need to be articulated. They need to be translated if we are going to have transnational facilitation and regulation of economic activity and economic actors. Uh, so let me pose the question. Can the process of comparative law, see, I want to point out something. Can we pose the question there? Can the process of comparative law provide this network of states with the benefits of politically legitimate and economically responsible lawmaking that can meet an increasingly globalized system of economic actors on its own terms, so to speak, 
you know, while escaping the two pitfalls, lack of adaptability and lack of democratic accountability. Finally, I get at this last stage to what Herbert Bernstein once gave us as an injunction. And I've violated it now for 25 minutes. I quote from one of his law book reviews in the American Journal of Comparative Law. Innumerable comparativists have felt the urge to marvel over our discipline. My plea is resist the urge. What we need much more than such soul searching is hard-nosed comparative work on clearly defined specific institutions or subject matter areas. And now having violated that injunction for 25 minutes, I'm, I'll try to come and honor it. I have a quote case study, a foolhardy term for a couple of remarks at the end of whether doing it is possible. And I'm going to do that by looking at the Trento project, the common core of private law project some of you are familiar with, but that has had quite a uh, splash in my view in Europe. This project is based on an approach that the late Professor Rudolf Schlesinger started here. Um, uh, beginning, begin at the bottom, close study of the law of, and the books, the law in action of particular systems, and begin to place them horizontally uh, on, uh, on a playing field, on a blackboard, on a desk where you can compare them across uh, the project. I'm going to use one particular one to close. The most recent substantive study produced by that project, um, Eva Marie Kininger's, uh, Kininger's uh, thorough report on international law governing non-possessory security interests in movables, provides my example. I apologize, but that's real law, uh, non-possessory security interests in movables. And so uh, even though in most modern law schools students don't get down to that level, uh, I'm going to have to use it if I'm going to be true to Herbert Bernstein. Right? First of all, it's a classic example of the awkwardness of fitting economic law into the standard private public law dichotomy. Creditor-debtor law, a major subset of that field, is a subject that only exists inside two very powerful bookends of classical public law, the bookend of consumer protection and the bookend of insolvency. So as a field, it is already uh, in the context of economic law uh, mixed, uh, a mixed uh, situation. It reveals exactly the challenge and the potential success in seeing comparative law as a work of coordination. Because for policy reasons stemming from different national views historically contingent about these bookends, the actual doctrines inside the bookends of consumer protection and of insolvency almost inevitably have to differ no matter how strongly market forces seek maximum facilitative framing of these credit devices in the applicable law. I'm going to now uh, um, list some of the issues Keeninger identifies as representing continuing substantially divergent positions. And I'm sorry, if you haven't studied this, it's going to sound Greek, or at least Latin. Right? Uh, the publicity requirement for the creation of non-possessory proprietary rights. The derogation by contract of mandatory rules of property law, such as retention of title, if the security holder claims continuation in newly manufactured goods. Right? Lease forfeitures in the event of the lessee's insolvency. The assignability of security interests and the related issue of the notification of the debtor or of the public. The validity of floating charges that cover all even after acquired property of the debtor. And above all, perhaps, the various mandatory or less than mandatory rules of private international law when the goods in question cross borders. That's where comparative law and coordination function is going to find its field. Now, the transparent communication of individual states, doctrines, and underlying policies among themselves as equals is really what this coordination mission of comparative law that I'm proselytizing for is about. Its advantages over top-down harmonization lie exactly on both counts. First, the inherent flexibility of the preferred approach. Professor Keeninger has a wonderful example of a Finnish law that permits the secured creditor to obtain only 50% of the value of the property covered by a floating charge in the case of the debtor's insolvency. Now that's a rule, how, that itself is a good example of how the typical conflict between two types of claimants, institutional lenders and trade creditors, who are arguing over the body of the commercial debtor, how it produces ad hoc legislative compromises. 50% is wonderful. That's Solomon. That's cutting the baby in half. You know, that's all the stuff you know, that you get anecdotally. 
Now, putting aside the actual fact that the Council of Ministers didn't want to force reconciliation of this and other similar differences by cramming them down the throats of recalcitrant member states, putting that aside, the choice between a top-down solution and a coordinated interstate one seems to me to lie with the latter. The bell should have rung, and I indulged a minute and a half. Uh, my 30 minutes are up. Um, now, I think the benefit lies with coordination. A directive or a regulation curing, I put that in quotes, one or even a series of these random variations, it does nothing but lay one patchwork over another. sarbanes oxley in a way, lays, lays one patchwork over another. When you would compare this with the preservation of the, of the harmony of both domestic systemic harmony and domestic political harmony, if a given country were persuaded by an exercise in comparative law to coordinate its laws with its fellows while smoothing out its own bumps. That's what happened at Trento, in a sense, when this study was presented and the Finnish delegate was sort of looked at and said, well, do you think they might do something about that in Finland? It's much nicer hearing that you know, in this community of equals right, than it is uh, when it is uh, pushed at you, uh, you know, from above. Now, those bumps as such may simply be the contingent result of historical accident. They may be the remnants of local political bargains now rendered obsolete by changing circumstances, including the development of the common market itself. Um, last page. Uh, they may be needed uh, even today in the context of today's political bargains. But in all most cases, coordinating local responses within this network frame seems to me a far sounder way to expend scholarly and policy-making energy than to move immediately towards imposed harmonization or unification. Now, it may strike you as not much more than bargaining in the shadow of the ruler, much as we have had in the United States, semi-coerced, market-driven harmonization or unification in what seemed like voluntary bottom-up uh, you know, harmonization. But that objection is not relevant if coordination of law in a system without a hierarchy is at issue, and it's even not as relevant if the hierarchy is not yet omnipotent, as in the EU. And more to the point, the objection doesn't touch at all upon the flexibility and democratic legitimation points. Within the context of the world we live in, a multi-storied economy, living in a number of one-story state houses, a new look at the mission of comparative law is appropriate, and mine, I hope, is one such look that may open some new approaches to our work. Thank you. I want to thank Professor Buxbaum for that very intriguing talk. Um, I know Herbert would have loved to have been here, and he might have taken issue with a few things. But in, in his absence, uh, we will take a few questions. We have time for a couple. Yeah. Is there a comment on whether antitrust competition policy in the U.S. and the EU are converging or diverging? Uh, they're converging, I think. Um, and especially in the area of merger control, they're converging in a very interesting way in which the previous U.S. Uh, ever more lax treatment of merger controls, starting in the Reagan era, right, uh, was met suddenly and uh, with some jarring by a surprisingly uh, vigorous, uh, both substantive and administratively applied antitrust, anti-merger policy in the European Union, and we are slowly moving towards kind of uh, uh, a, a bi-party, that is to say, we're now speaking of two parties, U.S. and E.U., a bi-party accommodation somewhere in the middle. Part of that is simply the, the classic procedural accommodation, who goes first, you know, a little bit like the FTC and the antitrust division used to do. Uh, but part of it, I think, is a substantive one. Uh, so we'll see you know, how that develops. Uh, the current discussions uh, uh, around Microsoft in, in the EU were, for me, a very interesting example of this. And that the jury isn't in yet, isn't back yet on that. So I think that's a case where there is indeed between the two major parties a kind of a funny uh, shifting of their grounds to meet a little bit in the middle. Yeah. May I add a, a, um, uh, an element to that that I find equally interesting? The Embergrand case, the recent U.S. Supreme Court case, uh, more or less denying under the uh, Antitrust Improvement Act, uh, denying civil action, private action rights by foreign victims of a global cartel uh, 
if their particular harm was caused only in their market, uh, and not in a spillover sense in the U.S. market. Uh, that was, to me, an interesting uh, U.S. Supreme Court um, retreat from what otherwise was beginning to look like an, an interesting opening towards more acceptance of um, convergence with other countries' approaches. Compare that with that recent case whose name I can't remember, Pan Pankowski or something, where Justice Ginsburg decided that the wire fraud uh, criminal action could be brought by the United States against a group of people who had uh, defrauded a foreign government of its tax revenues, right? and said, yes, that's bringable here because that's a violation of our US law. Although, of course, it's nothing but pulling another country's chestnuts out of the fire, <coughs> especially since the, the remedy in those wire fraud cases is that the, the um, money uh, re reclaim goes to the victim. So it went back to the foreign country, even though just a few months earlier, our circuit courts had still decided foolishly, foolishly, that we shouldn't uh, change the old rule that no state enforces the, the fiscal or revenue laws of another state, a nonsensical argument in today's role of friendly sovereigns working with each other. We're in the middle of a lot of little, little activity here, you know, uh, and it isn't all coherent, but I think it illustrates to some degree the looking across the border that is essential to this kind of convergence. Yeah. Yes. Where does your theory leave the field of international law? Uh, or are you giving up on international law as compared to comparative law as a bridge between the state and the global? Well, where it's would a you draw the line. When would you say we need this weaker coordination function? And at some point, we need to have no international law. As you know, Chief Justice Designate Roberts, or is he already Chief Justice? Uh, is it today or Wednesday? That, uh, Thursday. Thursday, okay. Chief Justice Designate Roberts, uh, uh, in his uh, responses to a couple of the uh, senators who questioned this, said, no, I fully agree. Uh, we should not cite uh, international law uh, authority in the Supreme Court, and I will try to persuade my, fellow br my, my future brethren of their error. Right? Uh, we have had a case uh, in the Supreme Court, the Altman case, Republic of Austria, which while it was very um, um, interesting for other reasons, clearly said, as did Verlinden against Central Bank in Nigeria before it, that foreign sovereign immunity is not a principle of public international law. It is only, in quotes, a, a principle of comity, of, of voluntary courtesy to another state. Uh, we have uh, just, uh, Chief Judge Ginsburg in the District of Columbia Circuit in a recent case involving the personal jurisdiction over a Ukrainian state agency. Uh, it involved the recognition and enforcement of an arbitral award in the United States under that subsection of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which says that there's a waiver of immunity if the foreign state agency has signed an arbitration agreement, uh, has an arbitration agreement. Uh, and even though they have had nothing to do in the United States, they had some assets here, the uh, victor in that foreign arbitration brings it to the United States. The Ukraine says, which a private foreign party is allowed to say, that even though there is this waiver in the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, you had no basis for personal jurisdiction over us here. And Ginsburg says, wait a minute, you're a foreign state, you're not a person under the 14th Amendment, or in this case, I guess, Fifth Amendment if it's Arbitration Act. Uh, and so we don't have to entertain that argument. And then he adds in a footnote, in fact, I'm not even sure we have to entertain that argument if it's a foreign private per, uh, a party, an alien private party. Uh, you're not, uh, you don't get the benefits of the 14th Amendment. Now, in that context of today, right, the purchase in the United States of public international law arguments right, is at a low, at an all-time low. And I don't hold out much hope for a while that we can add coordination of public law, i.e. international law principles, to this area. There's a little bit going on in treaty uh, coordination because we will look at the, uh, the uh, other states' uh, implementations or rather interpretations of treaties. For example, the Vienna Sales Convention, very interesting recent cases in which the Second Circuit says, well, I guess as interpreted by other courts that have had the Sales Convention before them, Parole evidence is not admissible, and even though we feel we love parole evidence, we can't use it anymore. Now, that's coordination a little bit, right, across uh, 
treaty functions. And of course, everybody, the devil can, well, I shouldn't call Justice Scalia the devil, but anybody, anybody can cite uh, scripture for his own purposes. Uh, in that recent ship case about the Americans with Disabilities Act, right, his dissent from imposing ADA requirements on foreign flag ships is based on the principles of customary international law, which we should res respect. Uh, Hard to know what to make of all this, you know, in, in unbalanced. But I'm focusing on uh, co uh, comparative law and private international law in the sense of the conflict of laws as the bread and butter issues for today. One more question. Whether, whether the mechanism is uh, hierarchical or ordering or coordination, I, I gather from what you say that the, the process amounts to homogenization. And or at least convergence. And if convergence is the wave of the future, <coughs> comparative law has a lot of work to do. Uh, because there isn't, despite the adoption of, uh, of rules from one jurisdiction to another, the tremendous trade in, 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 in legal rules, uh, there's still plenty of divergence. Um, so my question is, how much divergence can an integrated economy still live with? An integrated global economy um, may be just way ahead of where the law is. And, and it, it is, the, is the divergence uh, so dysfunctional that it will impair the, the, the progress of the global economy? Or, or can, is there room for a lot of play in the joints? Well, how long can California continue to impose its emission standards on manufacturers if they want to sell to a very large market like California, no matter what? Uh, their arguments about cost burdens are. There's lots of room for playing the joints. And particularly if the states form a sufficiently virtuous cartel now and then uh, that they hang together on some of these issues and maybe even bring up some of their lower, lower um, rigor brethren into that fold. That's what uh, a certain amount of unity is about. I don't think of convergence as being uh, convergence that the market in its ideal state, I say the market, actors, in their ideal state would wish to have, right? I think there is uh, both convergence at uh, unitary regulatory levels in various fields and convergence at varying regulatory levels that is still sufficient for a well-functioning economy. I mean, I, I come from a country, you know, that thinks it's a country even though it's only called a state. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, feeling that we can get away with it. Uh, and we will try to get away with it. I even um, uh, look at our corporation law, right? We are one of the outlier states in saying, no, the internal affairs doctrine is not yet a constitutional doctrine. And uh, despite the self-serving pronouncements of the Delaware Supreme Court, they haven't persuaded the Supreme Court, the, the real Supreme Court yet. So there's room, there's room, yeah. I want to thank you again, Professor sure. We have a reception in the loggia outside. We